Hello again and welcome. Originally I was planning on continuing my talks on differential probes. Unfortunately that's going to have to wait. When I made the last video showing this particular probe, one of the things that came up is my low frequency network analyzer started to go on the fritz. So I ended up having to tear that thing down and go through it. So that's all back together now and running. But then I ran into another small problem. This is the tree in our front yard. You can see all the roots are all exposed. This got hit by lightning the other day. And it actually blew all this sod right out of the root system. Some of the sod was located about 20 feet away from the base of the tree. Right about here is where the cable and the telephone lines go to the house. So it looks like what's happened is the root system of the tree has made it over to these lines and carried the current on through to the house. Now the actual transformer for the house is located on a different path going across the neighbor's yard. So there's a central transformer that feeds several houses in this neighborhood. You can see they have a ground strap across the top of this box. You can see their small point contact here. This ground strap goes down inside of the cable box. Inside this box they have a through connector. It's essentially like a splice. And then that has a ground bond on it. And that's what this is attached to. Now, of course this box is not connected. We use VOIP. What ended up happening is when that tree got hit by lightning, it blew the cover off of this box and this was located clear over at our neighbor's house. Like I say, we lost two light bulbs and the garage door opener. And with the garage door opener, they have two spark gaps in there that are about, I don't know, a half an inch long. It actually arced across those spark gaps and it burned away quite a bit of the circuit board. This is looking at the circuit breaker panel for the house. I had the cover off on this to inspect it. I didn't see any problems. Likewise, I went through and I checked the wiring of the house and everything appears to be okay. Everything looks tight. I don't see any points where anything arced. You can see these large wires that come through this conduit. That's the main feed for the home. The difference between each one of these large black wires and this copper braid is 120 volts and then the difference between the two black wires is 240. So again each of these phases routes through this main breaker. This one's rated for 200 amps and then each phase routes through one bus bar that feeds these smaller series of breakers. This large ground wire here that actually goes back to the water pipe. So all the test equipment was turned off at the time and it was plugged into surge protection outlets, which again, all those were turned off as well. All the test equipment that was damaged is tied together through a GPIB cable. And the jacketing of that cable is, you know, a very heavy ground. There's two screws that hold each of those cables into the test equipment. So you would think the common mode voltage between all that equipment would be very low. The one thing that they all share in common is, of course, they are tied to a common ground point. So again, what we have, you can see all the grounds and the neutrals route together. So the whites are the neutral here. They're all shared. And the copper wires are ground pass. So they all tie to this common bus. So I wonder if we just didn't induce a transient between two of these ground wires, perhaps, that run up to two separate outlets of the lab, you know, with enough current that we yank those grounds apart. Maybe that's what actually caused the damage to that. So today, I received a box from DigiKey. This should contain all the parts that I need to at least get an idea if we're going to be able to repair the test equipment that was damaged. One of the things that I'd recommend is if you have a fair amount of equipment like I do, I would talk to your insurance company before something bad happens and make sure that you are adequately covered. In my case, it looks like I am, so they would have opted to either try to repair the equipment or they would just replace it in my case. This was made by Hewlett Packard. It's a 59306 relay actuator. You can see it's just a bank of relays is all. And this connects to a GPIB bus. 
So unfortunately with this unit I didn't actually have the ICs that I needed to repair the unit. So what I did is I just socketed the ones that I knew that were bad as I was going through it. These are all 74 LS14s and you can see I've replaced them with a 74 LS04 inverter instead of the Schmidt trigger. This particular one is a open collector NAND gate and that's a 7438 I believe. Again, I didn't have that part, but I did have some 7403s. It's the same equivalent pinout, but it's a lower current device. So I've ordered all the correct parts. So what we can do is just go ahead and swap these out. It looks like the correct part, 7438. Is there a 74LS14? And that appears to be what they are. So we'll just go ahead and replace all three of these. These are the original parts that came out of this instrument. You can see they have the original HP house numbers, I'm assuming. These muxes are quite useful. I've got a couple of these and also have another one that's a VHF type relay. And I've had these for quite a few years. I've never had any issues with them other than this lightning strike. Again, I had fired this unit up, so I'm fairly confident as far as putting it back together. These are my two GPIB controllers. Unfortunately, both of these were damaged as well. These are produced by National Instruments. These are no longer supported, which is really quite unfortunate because the whole reason that I want this route is I start out with a ISA board and then I went to another ISA board and then I went to a PCI controller and basically what was happening is every time I'd get a new PC, I'd have to buy some new GPIB controller to run my test equipment. With this thing running off of Ethernet, I'm like, done for life, we'll never have to touch this again. And that worked fine until National decided that they would no longer write software for this. So what I did is I reverse engineered the protocol that they use. So LabVIEW has support for Ethernet built into it. And now I'm just basically using that to make direct calls to these two boxes to control my test equipment. And to be honest, it's never worked better. So I suspect that the problem is one or both of these chips. Uh, this one is a 75 ALS 162. This is a 75 ALS 160. So I don't think that there's anything really on the other side of this that we need to be too concerned about. Other than possibly the connector. The real nice thing that I like about using these is because all the equipment is accessible on Ethernet is I can actually run it from a remote wireless system. I think all I'll do is get the heat gun out. Let's go ahead and remove these. And these are our new parts. This is the 160. And these are the 162s. And I'll just tack this in there real quick. We'll plop a few screws back in here. If you own one of these and you have to take it apart, these little brackets are probably the easiest way to reassemble this. Let's just go ahead and put these screws in there to hold the bracket in place. Drop the circuit board down and then just remove these when you get ready to install the cover. So this is the 59306 that we had repaired. You can see I can manually control it. Currently I have the GPIB cable connected to the device that I just replaced the two ICs on. Let's give it a try. Alright, so that one looks like it works. Alright, so again this is our second GPIB controller. Again, I've replaced these two ICs. I suspect this is going to be the same problem. This controller is slightly different. This is the very first one I ever purchased, and I was running coax back in those days. So once I converted to 10 base T, I bought one of these adapters for it. 
All right, let's just see if it'll fire up. Now with this type of adapter, the link light won't become active. Seems to be working just fine. So the next thing we need to look at is the multimeter. Alright, so I've got the meter back together for the most part. Again, you can see the two ICs that have changed out. Let's just go ahead and turn this thing on. Let's have a look at our bus, so it should all be pulled high. It's ground. Again, these down here are all ground as well. So it's definitely different. Let's just see if it'll run. Looks like it's talking just fine. I think what I'll do is go ahead and button this thing up. It's about 11 o'clock right now. I started working on all this at about 12 o'clock noon. This has been a pretty long day. I think before we make any big mistakes, I'll just uh, let all this stuff sit and we'll take care of it in the morning. This is the cable modem that was damaged. You can see there's no signs of any damage to the coax cable or to the Ethernet ports. Looks like C526 and C527. Those are basically torn right off of the circuit board. Also looks like C525 and 524 damaged as well. So we're using voice over IP and that's a separate box and that was plugged into one of these ports. I suspect probably this one here and it damaged that modem as well. So I suspect that it somehow made its way right across this transformer. I thought that these are rated for somewhere around 1500 volts of breakdown. So I'm kind of surprised it would make it through. But I did check the power supply for both of these devices and they were fine. As a matter of fact, if I hook the power adapter up to this, uh, the power supplies will actually fire up. But uh, yeah, there's no lights or anything active. I suspect it's fried this main chip. Let's just go ahead and have a look inside of this. I've never had this apart. It's a Broadcom chip. I suppose that wasn't hardly even finger tight. Right. Oh, look at there. It's definitely done some damage to it. You know, it's kind of interesting as, uh, like I say, this doesn't communicate at all anymore. So, it's definitely more than just the Ethernet that got damaged. You know, it looks like there's some damage up in this area here as well. Hmm. that diodes there for transient protection. I'll bet you that's a short or an open. Looks like it's an open. You know I wonder if that's a spark gap. Yeah it says diode D603 but I think that that's probably a spark gap. This is the VOIP box. Let's have a look inside of it. 
There's no sign of any physical damage. Again, my primary concern was getting the lab equipment back up and running, and it looks like that's all fine, so no worse for the wear, I guess. So yeah, I think that's going to be it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. I think on the next video, we're going to take a second look at building a higher frequency version of this differential probe. So I had seen where Dave was selling a differential probe, and I thought it would be interesting to benchmark what I come up with against that probe. And I see now that they're selling some that are... 100 megahertz at least that's what they claim and I think they are uh, divide by 500 and a divide by 50 and they're rated for I think a thousand volts and they're selling those for about hundred and thirty dollars now hard to believe I can tell you that I'll probably spend more than that in parts well, that's all for now till the next video later